Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and welcome to, welcome to today's um, mobility talks uh, focused on blockchain in mobility. Uh, blockchain technology, or also called a DLT or distributed ledger technology, is an emerging technology that is still unknown in some parts of the mobility industry. Today, we are going to uh, learn about it and we are going to see six projects that are using the blockchain technology in their solutions. Do you hear me well? Please write plus in the chat if you do. Okay, great, thank you. So before we get started, I like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, uh, you can submit your questions to the presenters. To do so, just type your question in the chat. As time allows, the presenters will address as many questions as they can in the chat or during the panel session at the end of the event. Uh, if you only see your messages, you might want to, ta to take a look at the blue drop menu in the little chat window and switch it from uh, all panelists to all attendees and panelists. I'm going to do this actually right now. Okay, so I see you all. And uh, we will be recording this webinar and we will share the link after the event in, our, uh, in the EIT Urban Mobility um, um, social media uh, accounts. So, um, my name is Veronica Torres. I'm the host of the event and I'm a blockchain business developer, a consultant and trainer for Gelurida, a company developing several easy to use blockchain platforms since 2013 called NXT, Ardor and Ignis. At Gelurida, we'll help companies to build blockchain-based solutions in a fast way and with the minimum code needed. I will post my details in the chat in a minute so you can contact me in case you are interested to chat more after this event. With me, uh, Daniel Serra as the co-host of the event. Um, Daniel is Director of Innovation Hub South at EAT Urban Mobility. It's a great, he's a great connector and a great uh, also visionary person. Hello Daniel, please uh, can you briefly explain what uh, EAT Urban Mobility is? Sure, thanks Veronica. EAT Urban Mobility is a growing pan-European partnership uh, bringing together business, education, research excellence institutions and multifaceted city. Um, our goal is to facilitate and fund the collaboration between these players uh, to create mobility solutions that will accelerate the transition towards more livable urban spaces. Today we have an excited agenda and I hope that you will all enjoy it. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so we are going to be launching a series of polls. Daniel, can you launch the first poll, please, to all the audience so you all can answer? Um, yeah, I will do it. Thank you. We also have Bernadette Bergsma, Head of Communications and Stakeholders Relations at the EIT Urban Mobility, among the audience. Um, so, um, so, yeah, he, she will be actively participating in the chat. Bernadette, can you say hello? Okay, it's you, hello. Thank you. Um, and now it's a few minutes past four in Central European time. And without further ado, ooh, I would like to introduce you our first presenter, uh, Frederick Hanel. Freddy, can you um, switch on your video? And Daniel, can you switch off your video? Thank you. Um, hi, Frederick. Frederick studied. Hi, everyone. Oh, <laughs> Frederick studied physics engineering, right? He yeah. holds an MBA at INSEAD 
and he defines himself as an entrepreneur with success in piloting, parting, shifting companies to growth by evangelizing a strategy and empowering teams. Um, Frederick is now director of uh, business creation at the EIT Urban Mobility. And today he will talk about the EIT Urban Mobility program to startups. Hello, Frederick. Please, yes. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Veronica. So, um, well, again, uh, thank you so much for letting me have the opportunity to give you a brief uh, overview, a brief introduction to uh, the business creation activities at EIT Urban Mobility. Um, so I think one critical thing that it's important to know with EIT Urban Mobility is that everything we do focuses on the cities. And uh, independently of whether we support different academic programs or uh, different innovation activities, or as in my case, the business creation activities. So looking at startups and scale-ups, uh, we obviously help these startups and scale-ups interact with the cities and the city club at EIT Urban Mobility. Of course, we can't work with every stage and every phase of a startup. So typically we work with, I'd say early stage startups uh, where you have a minimum viable product um, and maybe you need help in defining your business plan, def you know, you need help in, in, uh, in fixing your pitch and you get coaching in your, uh, uh, in your business model and how you address your customers, etc. And then we support companies that are more in the scale-up phase, which means companies where they have a commercial product already launched on the market and they want to take a step out to new markets outside of their own country. So the way we do this is we have um, uh, four different programs. And the main program is the accelerator program where we accelerate early stage startups. Then we have the scale up hub where we accelerate scale ups as we call them or more mature startups if you wish and help those uh, scale-ups get access to pilots, to cities, to new opportunities across Europe. We also have a program called Go Global, where we help startups take a step out to new ecosystems outside of Europe and outside of the Horizon 2020 countries. For example, this year we will be targeting Silicon Valley. And finally, we have activities where we invest and provide financial support to startups and scale-ups. Looking at the accelerator, so we launched the program quite recently. Um, actually, the closing date was the last of May and the first program started 1st of July. We have different programs in the different regions of EIT or mobility. So we have five regions and in those five regions, we have started the accelerator programs in three regions. So the first region that is active today is the accelerator for the central region based in Munich, involving the central countries like uh, Austria, um, uh, and parts of uh, other Central Europe, basically. The second program is based in Barcelona and uh, it covers the south of our region, uh, of, our, uh, of the countries that we cover. It's run by uh, obviously Carnet and um, UTC in Barcelona amongst others. Then we have Accelerator Program East, which is based in Prague. 
run by PowerHub, and we also have participation from SpinLab, uh, Spin the um, accelerator program there, and Ecomotion in Israel. And two programs which will only start in early next year are the Accelerator West program and based in Helmond, sorry, in, in, um, in the Netherlands and the Accelerator North program starting in Copenhagen and covering the North region. Did I? Each of these uh, accelerator programs accepts five startups per batch with two batches per year. So the first batch uh, where we had, uh, it was a ratio of one accepted startup per 10 applications. So in total, roughly between 140, 150 applications, um, gave five interesting startups per region. And a lot of these are providers of mobility as a service kind of solutions. We also have uh, logistic solutions. A couple of them are providing new kinds of electrical vehicles. And last but not least, uh, a few of them are also providing um, data aggregation, data analysis, uh, data prediction, kinds of uh, uh, services that they provide to cities and uh, businesses uh, in the cities. Looking at the scale-up hub, we have more partners here per the scale-up hub obviously covers all of the different regions we support and it's focused a lot around making introductions to cities and helping the startups get business with the cities. And um, one important part of this is, of course, uh, pilots. So we have three cities that have committed to carry through uh, three pilots where we go in and we provide a grant of 50,000 euros per pilot to help the scale-ups carry these, uh, be successful in the pilot. Looking at the companies, we had a boot camp session um, and uh, where we selected uh, first 21 scale ups to participate in the boot camp. And at the, uh, after the two day boot camp, 15 scale ups were selected as uh, admitted to the scale up hub activity. Looking at the funding, um, uh, opportunities. I mean, apart from, of course, the, uh, the, the grants that we provide to the pilots, we also provide to every startup company that is accepted to the accelerator program, we provide them with a, a 15,000 euro grant. Then we also do investments. And uh, we had a call out now where we, um, it, it closed uh, 19th of June. And we had a number of applications and we're currently doing the due, due diligence for investments. This is a very fast process. So the companies that did apply, they will receive a final notification of the investment before the end of July. Uh, and in this specific case, it was focused around companies who had been compromised in their funding processes when raising capital uh, from venture capitalists or angels. We're also um, partners with the European, the EU Startup Prize, uh, which is uh, actually uh, initiated by the European Commission, where we will be participating as, a, uh, as an investor, listening to pitches from the winners of this program and uh, making the investments, of course. So this is a short overview of uh, the business creation activities within EIT of mobility. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, um, before we continue, I would like to address a question to the audience. How many of you are, are entrepreneurs working in, in or involved in some way in a startup? Please write plus in the chat 
Uh, Frederick, can you turn on your video for a second, please? I have a question for you. Yes, yes of right. Course. Yes. So, Pero we uh, we will launch the final poll. Okay, the we have already the results. I will close it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Here are the results of the poll. Um, so, Frederick, maybe I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm not sure how to get in contact with this such a complex and big organization. You are uh, the EIT Urban Mobility is doing a lot of activities. So what would be the best way for those entrepreneurs to connect with the organization? Yeah, so, I mean, there are two ways. The, the most common way, and of course, uh, all these, because there's, there's so much interest, I mean, uh, usually we direct people to the website. You can find all the information you need for the ongoing calls the ongoing opportunities for startups to apply for a program or to apply for fi financing as well so when we launch the the new investment initiatives uh, the application will be done in a similar way as uh, you apply for uh, an acceleration program or a scale-up hub program for example on the website of course you can always send an email to any one of my colleagues or to myself uh, and uh, we'd be happy to, to answer any questions you have. Uh, please note, though, that there's, uh, I mean, we've had more than, I'd say, four or five hundred companies showing interest in our programs just for these batches. So uh, it can be a bit challenging for us to get back to you in person. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Frederick. Um, so, um, uh, please feel free, Frederick, to interact with the audience in the chat and keep an eye. Uh, so in case there is any question addressed to you, we kindly ask you to answer. Um, and now, yeah, we are seeing the poll. So we see that um, we have 26% uh, of uh, people that comes from academia and research. And then we have 18% of people comes from medium or small companies or corporations. There is a tiny 7% of startups. Um, and then we have also 12% of consultants and 8% uh, of local authorities. Very well. Um, there is a 12% of blockchain and crypto enthusiasts. So very well as well. Um, tiny 5% the, of the audience answer that I'm a citizen and 5% of NGO. Well, uh, very interesting. Thank you, Dania, for sharing the poll. Um, so we can close it now. And um, our next keynote speaker is a remarkable expert on blockchain technology, uh, Professor Dr. Philip Sandner. Uh, head of the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center at the Frankfurt School fi of Finance and Management. Uh, Philip, can you turn on your video, please? So you come into the Twitter. Um, his extensive, uh, his expertise includes blockchain uh, technology in general, crypto assets, the digital programmable euro, which I expect word we are talking, uh, we are going to talk about later. Tokenization of assets and rights and digital identity. Uh, the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center advises financial institutions and organizations, uh, industrial corporations, and also startups concerning their blockchain activities. Uh, so Professor Dr. Sandner is also a member of the FinTech Council of the Federal Ministry of Finance and was engaged in the EU Blockchain Observatory established by the European Union. He co-founded the German Blockchain Association, the International Token Standardization Association, and the Multi-Chain Asset Managers Association. Welcome, Philip. It's a pleasure to have you here in today's event. Please, uh, the floor is yours. You have to unmute yourself. So here yes. now it works. Thank you very much. As always, uh, technology is not easy. Um, thank you, very Veronica, for the invitation. Always I will be quick. Well. 
presentation on uh, blockchain in general, um, also including those people who might not uh, have dealt with this technology too much, um, but I will try to be as quick as possible. And uh, next, I would also like to emphasize the topic of the so-called digital programmable euro. That's very important because this will be, in my mind, the most important aspect there in the blockchain area um, up until then. Uh, not too much is possible, but as soon as the digital euro is running on a blockchain system, then you can think of all kinds of business models um, in the future. So, make it a little bit soft. Um, so, thank you for the, uh, for the presentation. Uh, exactly, um, we have built a blockchain center at the university, um, which is called Frankfurt School, that's uh, sitting in Germany, in the middle of Germany, in Frankfurt. Frankfurt School is a business school. It's uh, focusing on business, finance, and uh, computer science. And um, for us, blockchain is very important because it will drive the financial market of the future. That's why we, uh, four years ago, started to um, push this topic also to educate students in this area. But nowadays we are also a little bit uh, like an applied consulting company, doing a lot of consulting uh, tasks for ministries, companies. Uh, we have now engaged uh, concerning mobility, we have now engaged in one project where the goal is to use uh, tractors and connecting them directly to the digital programmable euro on blockchain, such that these tractors can be used in a pay-per-use business model. So you drive the tractor and while you're driving, you pay money. Uh, so it's similarly like leasing, but it's much more fine-grained. So as soon as you drive, um, the, the, the tractor costs money. If you stop the tractor, it does, co does not cost right about um, um, starting with diffusion. I already have the feeling that the next hype is coming. Uh, there is things to build, companies to grow, uh, budgets to take and so on. It's just starting. So therefore it will be an amazing time uh, starting probably again this year, maybe then going on for the next five to 10 years up until we have then uh, some kind of maturation. What does 100% mean in terms of market coverage? That means that any kinds of value and assets are running on some kind of blockchain system. That's stocks and securities, that's bonds, that's the euro, that's all, of course, also crypto assets such as Bitcoin and Ethereum bonds. All these assets are running on technological platform, which is called DLT, that's something like blockchain. Um, then we will have reached 100% of market coverage. To understand blockchain technology, I would like to very quickly uh, um, emphasize the basics, but not from a technological way. So what you see here is the illustration of a payment transmission going from one person, that's Sophie, to Alex on the other hand side. And this payment transaction, that's 10 euro, uh, goes around the globe. It's going from here in Germany to, say, Argentina. And the system right now works as follows. You're going to your local bank, then uh, you, you uh, tell them that you would like to transfer 10 euros. Then the money goes to the correspondent bank of, in this case, Germany. Then it will go to the correspondent bank in Argentina. It would then go to the local bank in Argentina, and then the money would arrive uh, at Alex. The point is here, the system works, but it doesn't work very efficient because once you are spending, once you're initiating this transfer, then you, don't know exactly when the money arrives in Argentina and you also don't know how much money arrives uh, because the system costs time and transaction fees to process such payments. Why is this? Because the, the system is built in the form of pipelines. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's, the, that's the image I would like to create here. The system is made uh, like pipelines. You're putting something in this pipeline here in Germany at, at some point of time later on in Argentina, uh, this 10 euro are popping out of this kind of pipeline yeah that's that's the image i would like to create so it's a pipeline uh, pipeline system and the blockchain is exactly the opposite architecture you need to view the blockchain something like an register sitting in the cloud and this register sitting in the cloud can be accessed by any transaction party on the entire world so here you have Sophie wanting to initiate a money transfer to argentina Sophie is connecting to this register sitting in the cloud
then Alex will notice this immediately, a couple of seconds later, and therefore this is not the pipeline mode of value transfer as we have built the international uh, financial system anymore, but rather it's a register mode. And therefore um, the money basically arrives by this register mode uh, after a couple of seconds. So you're, you're initiating a transfer here in Germany and the money will arrive in Argentina a couple of seconds afterwards. It does work already in the area of blockchain, um, and cryptocurrencies, and it will very soon also work uh, with other traditional currencies, say the euro, the Swiss franc, uh, the, the US dollar, and so on. And probably uh, the, the system which is doing this in the very first day is called Li Libra, initiated by Facebook at that time. So if you would like to memorize one single word about blockchain technology, then please memorize the word register technology. In my mind, there is no better way for describing what blockchain is. It's a register technology. Um, if you are storing money in this register, then you have a capitalized register. So the register is there to organize ownership of money and assets. Alternatively, especially in the area of mobility, for example, in the register, you could also store car registrations. Yeah? So that's also register, the car register. But in this case, um, the example uh, is done for a capitalized register. That's basically then money being stored in a blockchain system. And the register is there to organize money and to also allow transferrals of money, say from here to Argentina in a couple of seconds. But even more so, and now it gets really exciting, is that, uh, that it's not just about a direct transfer from here to Argentina. It's also about programming money flows. That means I might be interested in sending money to somebody, but only once that specific conditions have been met and this, for example, are then financial services, which we are knowing today, they are called um, escrow accounts, factoring, leasing, loans, interest payments, all these financial services, which you all know, they are um, in a technological speaking way, they are programmable money, and you can easily program such money flows on a blockchain DLT based register with a couple of lines of code. So a loan, for example, or a factoring solution um, takes you, 20 or 40 lines of code, which you deploy on a blockchain-based system, and then you have created a loan, 40 lines of codes. Whereas uh, in the current world, you have to create all kinds of APIs, uh, IT servers, server architectures, and so on. So this should indicate that, um, uh, that it does make sense to run financial assets on blockchain-based systems, not just for um, organizing the ownership in form of the register, but also to program money flows to have financial services ready, such as leasing, factoring, and so on. And now let's come to the area of tokenization, and then we are uh, directly approaching the, the need for mobility here. This all started with Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency. It then moved on to utility tokens, which are called Ethereum. I guess some of you guys know this. And the point is here that uh, the joint thing which is existing in all kinds of blockchain systems is the so-called token. And the question is, what is the token? The token is basically some kind of container where you can put something in. So in the utility token area, you took a software license, like the right to use some kind of software, you package this license right in a token, and the token is then running on a blockchain-based system. And exactly in the same way, um, you would have, for example, the euro being put into a token, and then you have the digital programmable euro. That's a topic where now the, the European Central Bank, the European Commission, uh, and multiple governments in Germany are really investigating whether we want to have the euro running on a blockchain-based systems or uh, what are the advantages and so on. And similarly, for example, you could also make a stock like a securities inside a token and let it run on blockchain-based system. This then leads to the fact that you have at some point of time one blockchain system could be Facebook's Libra or another system where you have multiple assets on top of them. You have securities there, you have money there, you have software license rights there. They are all running on one and the same DLT system. And then suddenly it gets exciting because now you can do the following. For example, take this house. This house creates multiple rights, the ownership right, the usage right, and the Lien right for liquidation purposes if needed. You take these rights, you know, these rights, they are out there since 500 years. That's nothing new. Um, you take these rights, you package them into tokens, you let them run on a blockchain-based system, and then you have created the building blocks for the digital economy of the future. Why is this? 
because you can now do new business models um, in the area, for example, of access rights. Um, what is an access right? That's basically a temporary right that somebody can access the real estate object. So that's a usage right. Uh, why is this needed? It's needed, for example, for um, buildings uh, of companies because uh, you would like to have employees going in specific rooms or floors and you would like to not allow them in specific other rooms. Um, so this can all be organized uh, by putting usage rights in a token and then suddenly you can also combine guarantees with one and the same system. So for example, you have to house a digital as a digital twin on a blockchain based system and on the same uh, chain, you also have an insurance company, which is providing some kind of guarantee for the house. So there is no paperwork, no silo based structures. You have one platform, the house is there, the insurance is there and, and all these devices, then they can start interacting with each other. But you have to have the euro on the same blockchain. Otherwise, uh, you do not have the payment means uh, to organize all these business models. And now let's turn uh, towards the end of the presentation uh, to, uh, the, to the mobility, to the cars. So you see here, the car is also creating a right of ownership. It's providing a usage right, and it's also providing the Lien right again. You take these rights, package them into tokens, let them run on blockchain-based systems, and then you have uh, the building blocks again for the business models of the digital economy. That's leasing, car sharing, insurance, car investments, and theft control. Again, you have to have the euro on the blockchain uh, as well, because only then you have these seam, uh, seamless processes. So let's take the idea of insurance again. You have the car on the chain, for example, the usage ride. I'm driving from here to say Barcelona, uh, I'm, that's the usage ride. And uh, on the same chain, there is the insurance and the insurance is um, insuring my ride from here to Barcelona. Um, because it's happening on one and the same chain. And then if I'm arriving in Barcelona, um, the euro flowing to the insurance company might be, I don't know, eight euro 50. It's all happening on the same chain, no silos, no paperwork, um, and uh, no um, um, tiresome or effort some uh, reconciliation. The same is true for car investments, for example. Um, we all know leasing. Leasing is basically financing cars by huge uh, uh, asset managers, right? And in the future, you, you will have one car. Um, you, this car might have a couple of investors who are investing in the car. And in case I would like to earn money, then I can invest in a couple of cars. I would purchase 10 cars at 10% um, and I would create my, let's call it a investment portfolio on cars because I believe that cars are a good investment, right? And why is it so important to have the digital programmable euro? Um, because it would allow us to have extremely efficient cross-border payments. So the example what I have presented previously concerning Argentina would work at a much higher efficiency in terms of cost, quality, and time. Then you could automate business uh, processes and payments. That's basically technically done by the smart contracts um, because you can program money flows, as I have explained. And uh, this is now, that's difficult to explain, but that's one of the key aspects here because um, you are integrating delivery and payment. So in case I'm consuming an insurance, then the insuring company is delivering a service to me. That's the insurance policy, right? And for this, I have to pay 50 euro per month. Um, payment is currently done with a bank account. The insurance uh, is being done by paperwork. So that's two systems which are not nicely connected to each other, the bank here and the insurance company there. And in a blockchain-based system, you would integrate this because you would have one single DAT system. My euro is on the system, the, the insurance company is the system, um, and I would pay for an insured product or an insured ride to Barcelona on one and the same system, such that basically this integration is happening without any silos construction. And then you would also be able to have like fine-grained fine -grained mini uh, uh, insurances, not these bulk solutions just running for one year. This then also is related to the following aspect. I have explained a very basic thought of how tokenization is being done. Imagine that every single item, any single asset out there is having a digital twin on a blockchain uh, such that a payment can be done, such that machines can allow payment and so on. And here we are now in the, again, in the mobility and the logistics area uh, because very soon we are coming to a new 
degree of the machine economy. This means that agents, devices, and sensors, they are not just connected to the internet, that's the IoT, but they are also starting to engage in payment transfers to each other. Uh, I'm just presenting uh, like uh, a couple um, of examples now. And of course, IT security and system resilience uh, is also extremely good in blockchain-based system. So let's talk um, one more aspect on the digital euro. You have multiple types of programmable money. So on the left-hand side, you see the so-called CBDCs. That's a very, very hot topic these days. This means that a central bank like the ECB is issuing the euro at some point of time, uh, such that we can use the digital programmable euro for the aforementioned business models because the ECB has issued the euro on a blockchain-based system. Alternatively, in the middle, it's also possible that a private company, such as a bank, for example, is issuing money privately. Uh, in case we are using online banking, then we are typically using this middle way because we are accessing the online banking service of a bank that is basically operated by a commercial bank. This is not operated by the central bank. So the prevalent money which is out there in our, our society is the middle one, which is called currency issued by a regulated entity. And currently the topic is the following, that uh, uh, the consensus is slowly emerging that either the hybrid model of a CBDC or the indirect model of the CBDC should be the one where the ECB should start working on at some point of time. The problem is this now, and uh, I hope I, I might be so honest, the problem is that China has started already 2014 and now tests a system where people are now receiving their salary on the Chinese DCEP network, right? So they, and with this, um, even ECB employees are saying that China is at least five years ahead. Uh, if you talk to other ex experts, realistically, you could assume that China is six to eight years ahead. So honestly, Europe must really move very quickly here. Um, so the, the CBD, CBDC for the euro, that's basically the digital euro issued by the ECB, might be launched at, uh, in the year 2026 and 2028, but China is launching their system this year or next year. That's really shocking and uh, we need to work, uh, we need to do something here. And this probably will be this one here, that uh, we might have private companies issuing money that's here. Uh, because in Western countries, typically innovation is not so much driven by the government like in China. Um, it's more driven by the private sector. And therefore, I think we need in Europe more initiatives uh, such, such as the, the tractor example I presented, um, such that private companies are developing ICs, IT systems to let the euro run on blockchain-based systems. And there are a couple of systems like this now we are slowly being developed such that a digital euro could also be operated as of next year, but not in the mode of an hybrid CBDC or an indirect CBDC, but more like in some kind of yeah, privately organized digital euro. Yeah, um, we, in case you have questions, I'm happy to discuss this more in detail uh, at another time. And there, exactly therefore, we have um, uh, approximately one month ago, we have drafted a roadmap towards a digital programmable euro. And this has really, uh, gotten some interest with uh, within 100 uh, within two within two days 48 hours we have received uh, 100 signees and right now i think it's 180 uh, signees um, who are really supporting this roadmap and what does the roadmap say in detail it says that right now for this year we should focus on building knowledge because senior managers in companies banks mobility companies and also in the public government, senior managers simply don't understand blockchain to a degree that they can really do decisions providing budget. This is still missing. Uh, this also includes, for example, the European Commission. They are pushing blockchain a lot, um, but they also need to understand much in a much better way what exactly can be done with the technology and how can it uh, be used uh, for European businesses. Then by 2021, uh, uh, we, that would be now the first solution on how to get the program of a euro done. We could have a DLT enabling payment API uh, that's being developed by a couple of banks now already. By 2022, we might have an euro token standard to be issued on various DLT networks. It's now the, the euro on top of a blockchain network. And if the ECB now starts this year, then it's realistic that uh, maybe by 2024, the ECB might have the same uh, being done like uh, 
Chinese organizations have already been doing it um, by now. Yeah. And that's now the final chart. I think uh, where we are going is the following. Uh, we have multiple in industry domains in Europe, mobility, machinery, sensors, logistics, and energy. And we have, of course, multiple finance domains, as always, payment, leasing, securitization, factoring, and escrow agents, just to, make, to provide some examples. And I think what now happens is that these industry domains on the left-hand side, they will in be integrated with the finance domains on the right-hand side. And that's exactly the best cases for blockchain. Um, that's basically where we also see a couple of startups, uh, very promising ones, emerging. And uh, this is now the example. So that's a drug. That's an autonomous truck. The autonomous truck might be able to drive autonomous, autonomously, but the truck will only live autonomously if it's also able to operate at a small profit. So the revenues uh, the truck is getting needs to be a little bit higher than the cost the truck is having for electricity and so on. This indicates that this truck at some point of time will not just drive autonomously, but it also will receive and send euro autonomously to other devices and the profit center, which keeps it basically slowly uh, a little bit above um, in the profit area because it does not make sense to let this truck drive uh, in case the truck is not doing a profit and at some point of time it would stop. And what's happening here, you see here the truck which is receiving euro and sending euro this drug is combining mobility and payment. And, and the last example for this presentation is this one here. You have a sensor um, that could be mobility, but that could also be another area. The sensor is co co collecting data. And once you would like to get the data, for example, better data, then you could ask the sensor and uh, say, please sensor, send me the data, um, uh, the data um, collected yesterday, uh, temperature, humidity, and so on. And the sensor would then tell you, yes, I can deliver this data, but, but you please first send me one euro fifty. And if the money arrives with the sensor, then the sensor is supplying the data to you, right? So this is machine to machine payments, which is now occurring. It will take a while, but in my mind, these are the business models in the future. And again, here you have here sensor technology from the industry domain, again, meeting the finance domain. And in this case, that would be an escrow account, for example. And therefore, I think the most promising business models, startups, uh, companies, and so on, they are exactly at the intersection between industrial domains and uh, finance domains. Um, and of course, mobility is, uh, a, few, is a key field here. Um, doesn't matter if it's mobility of human beings, you know, like moving persons around, or logistics, uh, that's basically moving goods and um, goods around the world. Yeah, with this, I would like to um, finish the presentation. I think I was a couple of minutes too long, uh, sorry uh, for this. And um, yeah, uh, in case you have further questions, then you're welcome to write me an email or Twitter or LinkedIn or any kind of other means, whatever, however you would uh, are communicating best. Excellent presentation. Uh, Felix, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. I'm going to save my questions for later, but I must say that Philip has a brilliant paper uh, consisting of an analysis of blockchain technology in the mobility sector. And you have the link in the chat because Daniel just posted it a few minutes ago. Okay. So please have Philip feel free to interact with the audience and keep an eye in the chat in case there are any questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the next presenter is Andres. Andres, can you switch on your video, please? I would like to give a warm welcome to this first startup presenter. Um, Andres um, is based in Spain. He holds an uh, international MBA and has more than six years of professional experience in the aerospace sector uh, with a high interest in supply chain, transportation, logistics, and blockchain. Um, Andres is the co-founder and CEO of ChainGoTech. So Andres, welcome. The floor is yours. Hello. My presentation, ready? Uh, we don't see your presentation yet. Now, yes. Yes, you do not? Do, you do now, okay. 
Well, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Veronica, for your presentation. Uh, I'm Andres Garrido, as, as Veronica said, I'm CEO and co-founder of ChengoTech. Uh, do you know how many packages are being delivered day to day in our cities? It's it's amazing, and the number is just growing. Obviously, urban logistics is blooming, and it was even before COVID-19 situation. Imagine now. However, the communication, the supply chains of urban logistics is, is really complex. Like it, there is a lot of different parties involved, and taking a phrase from the previous uh, from uh, Professor Philip uh, Sandner, I would like to say. Uh, I don't know if there is something in the chat. Okay. I would like to say that he's completely fine. I mean, today we are talking about a, a lot of different companies that have to integrate communications in order to be sure that the package that you receive at your, ho at your house, it's coming from the e-commerce where you buy it. And that means a lot of different systems that need to intercommunicate through APIs and difficult architect um, architecture, IT architecture. What blockchain can provide is it's a registration, it's a registration technology, as Dr. Philip said, uh, Sander said, and it allows to flex to make more efficient, way more efficient the way these companies are communicating between each other today. And one big thing, because most of these intercommunication today are done through complex track and trace management system that big logistic operator has in place. However, most of these uh, track and trace uh, systems have the same problem, which is the immutability of the delivery. There is a lot of different arts, actors that can provide the final delivery to the client. It can be uh, by, as, as you can see here, as a live smile uh, company or from a pickup point. So there is a lot of different places where you can be picking up your merchandise, your product from the e-commerce. And most of these systems today have no visibility of the point of the delivery. That means a lot of things between uh, between them. I would like to see. Uh, I would like to say that uh, you can you can have problems of fraud, like someone that is picking the, the merchandise, the product, without being the correct person to be received. You can have legal disputes with the client saying that he dis, he didn't uh, receive the merchandise, the product as he should and the e-commerce saying, or the last mile company saying that they provide the service. And there is also a potential reputational cost. At the end, when every time that we're having problems with the deliveries, at the end, we decide not to buy anymore in this e-commerce. That's exactly what we are try what we are solving from Chain of Freight. That's one of the main aspects that we want to solve in Chain of Freight. We are working closely with, logis with logistic operator to provide this proof of delivery in an immutable way. So connecting with their track and trace uh, system as they have today, we are able to integrate a proof of delivery based on blockchain that can guarantee when the product has been delivered, avoiding these potential legal disputes and these potential discrepancies between the clients and the provider. And at the same time, we, close, we work very close to the courier because right now they have a problem. If they are working for a specific logistic operator, they need to have a specific system uh, that allow them to work with this track and trace management system. Usually couriers cannot uh, work with several logistic operators at the same time. So it's a very inefficient way because we are seeing uh, trucks going into and vans going into the city with not fully charged because they are only are able to work with only one logistic operator at the same time. What do we provide? We provide an online platform, collaborative online platform, where the different parties involved, I, as it said, uh, it's, it was shown before, can share information knowing that the information that they are shared is immutable. So as Professor Philip Sanders said before, we are working in this type of registration technology, where all this information that comes from the different system of the all different parties are integrated in, an, in the same ledger having complete visibility and traceability of what's going on at every point. Why blockchain is important here? Well, as I said, today, this can be solved with the current system. This is something that uh, it can be solved to a point, but in a very inefficient way. Uh, as we are saying, like it, it, you need to have very complex API system to integrate one system with, with the other. 
And usually new players, new newcomers like last mile companies need to create or to generate system that are allowed to talk with the different system of the logistic operator, which usually are much older. So blockchain technology is a very, very efficient way to make this process much more flexible, much more fast and more cost effective. We are also seeing after the coronavirus crisis that the situation is being more and more complex. E-commerce is blooming. Now uh, the networks that we have in the current cities are saturated and there are only two potential solutions to that. To expand the logistic infra infrastructure, which means more vehicles uh, in our cities, or to make the current logistic processes more efficient. I want to share with you some data from ICOP, which is an organization here in Spain, an association of, of big, of, uh, big distribu distribution companies that uh, mentioned that in this year, the cost related to log urban logistics is around 15 and 24,000 million euros only in Spain. That cost is related to environmental costs, traffic jam, and urban accidents. So imagine the, the amount of money, this is 2% of the Spanish uh, PIB. So it's, it's a lot of cost that we can reduce using more uh, efficient technologies. At the same time, as I say, as logistic infrastructure uh, need to expand because e-commerce is growing, uh, we are seeing that in cities like, like Madrid here in Spain, currently 35% of the vehicles uh, inside the cities are for logistic distribution. The, the, ten, the trends say that this number in, in five years will go up to 47%. That's 47% of all the cars inside the city will be only handling these e-commerce services, which is a lot. That's why we see a big potential now in using this kind of technologies to make this process much more efficient. How we make money? Basically, we are a paper use system. So right now what we have on the market and what we are working with, with the companies is this immutable proof of delivery. Every time that a last mile company or a logistic distributor decide to use this uh, system, they, pay, they have to pay for, for use it in. Obviously we integrate with their, their system and we maintain the, the blockchain regarding that. Regarding blockchain, we are blockchain agnostic, so we are not, we are not specifically uh, a network. We are a software and we can deploy regarding the needs of our client. Usually we try to go for hybrid solution to reduce a uh, transactional cost, but at the same time to provide this complete traceability to the third parties that can decide to be integrated in the solution. We are a company of, we are a startup. We have three years the market now. We started working mostly with international logistics. So that's why we know very good logistics itself in first in a more, let's say international environment. That's why we are working currently with more than 11 clients, big corporations, managing a lot of different shipments from container to any other type, managing a lot of documents and in a lot of blockchain transactions. These, these are numbers only from this year, from 2020 and we are over 600 transactions regarding this kind of operation. Our team, we are 10 member team, uh, me and Jordan Sorensen as the co-founder of the project. Uh, we have obviously ba a big uh, background, a uh, big team in te the technological part of the team, the technical part of the team covering blockchain and the backend the, uh, needs, and also a strong sales team that allow us to come to the situation that we are here to now. Uh, we are Chengo and we are here to make logistics, urban logistics or international logistics more efficient than it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. We are a little bit behind of the schedule, but I would like to ask you a very quick question. What are the real benefits you observe in real life, real experience from your customers when they use your solution? As I say, if we focus in urban mobility right now, as, as we are in urban mobility talks, the proof of delivery is something that it's, it's super important for, for e-commerce because uh, they, are, they have a lot of problems both in, in the delivery and the, and the reverse logistics. So when you have to return an object to, to the to e-commerce the e itself, they have a lot of problems to be able to track back in the system these products. So that's where they see a lot of value in using blockchain in order to have completely sure 
when the transaction has been done, uh, so they can avoid any kind of disputes between the different parts involved. Okay, great, interesting. Okay, thank you so much, Andres. Um, our next presenter is Daniela. Daniela, can you share your screen, your video? Switch on your video, please. Um, um, so Daniela Schiffer uh, is presenting the second startup. Daniela is based in Berlin, Germany. Hello. Um, she has always been passionate on how the usage of media changes our society. She holds a Master of Fine Arts and New Media and attended classes in sociology and media theory. Um, she works as a mentor at several startup initiatives and founded Changers.com in 2012. Quite uh, a journey uh, right now, eight years. And Changers is a company in the field of tokenizing, tokenized uh, incentivization for health and climate mitigation. Hello, Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Veronica, for the nice introduction. So, um, as I said, my name is Daniela and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Changers.com. And right now we think we have only one big problem in our world, but there's a much bigger one looming and that is climate change. And change of our behavior is necessary, but we all know just too well how hard this can be. So with Changers, we built a purpose-driven token. You can think of it as something like a green bit token, a uh, token which you can earn just by behaving in a certain way and saving CO2. Oh, sorry, here we go. So uh, what is our approach? Uh, we have built a mobile app which playfully incentivizes healthy and sustainable behavior and is really easy to use. We have all different kinds of gamification tools uh, to keep people motivated and on board. Um, we have integrated a state-of-the-art machine learning technology to measure and identify mobility patterns of our users automatically. And we have integrated a multi-vendor marketplace as an exchange for tokens our users have earned. Um, as an example, let's uh, use the current corona situation we have in cities that we are enforcing uh, mostly cycling and other modes of transport and try to reduce single car drives as much as possible. And we need to find ways on how to get citizens to listen to these rules for a prolonged period of time and to find positive and meaningful ways to incentivize and engage people. Um, so with your contribution, you earn. CO2 tokens. And what is the huge advantage of the tokenization? It's that you cannot only apply rules on how to earn um, tokens, but you can also define how to spend them. This means, for example, you can spend your tokens in local shops or restaurants or for climate friendly products and services. So the value of your CO2 token would stay in your local community and wouldn't go to Amazon. Um, this is actually something that uh, this is quite what was quite nice to see in the presentation from Philip that uh, we believe that in the next three years, either the IMF or the European Central Bank is going to come up with a tokenized euro. This means that besides cash and bank money, there will be a third way to provide money. And again, because tokens have this huge advantage to apply rules on how to earn and how to spend them. Um, which makes tokens just so much smarter than current fiat money. You can steer people's behavior and that is what we need for climate change mitigation. Uh, we have been working with international corporations since 2016, mostly in the field of corporate wellness and social responsibility. And with Changers, we can cater for any kind of usage or need. This means we offer Changers as software as a service as white label, and since this year, also a software development kit. Um, in 2019, we expanded our portfolio and are now also catering for cities. The first two applications we developed are for the city of Bielefeld and for the city of Vienna. Oh, no. And in 2020, we developed the possibility to integrate our Changer C2 token into any existing app. This means we can make every city app, every transportation or media app an active tool against climate change, increase involvement 
with, with uh, their audience and of course also increase long-term retention. Business model is quite straightforward. We have uh, one-time setup fees for white label and SDK integration, and we have recurring revenues via monthly license fees. We are currently have 12 employees. Eight of them are highly skilled developers and uh, Marcus, my co-founder and myself, do the administrational and sales part. And uh, both of us together bring more than 25 years of experiences in high and green tech marketing. Oh, and that's actually already it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking very much forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Excellent presentation. So could you explain us in a very quickly time some reactions of cities when you explain this business model, are they ready for this? Um, what are the reactions do you think? Um, everyone loves it. And then comes the administrational part and the bureaucracy. So um, what we have seen is that uh, the, the need or the understanding that solutions are needed is really, really increasing over the past two years. We have been talking with cities since 2015, more or less. Um, so in the what, last one, one and a half year, that really took up speed. Um, and we now also have the experience to help cities to um, overcome certain um, technological issues, maybe also data, data privacy issues. And I think that for us, it's really good that we can show that we have done this with big corporations, with other cities, and we are like really very conscious when it comes down to mostly data privacy issues, which I think is the, the thing that stopped or, or that, that uh, is the biggest concern, also for citizens, actually. Okay, interesting. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Daniela. So our next presenter is uh, James, James Malak. James, please, can you start switching on your video. Um, James uh, divides his, his time between Thailand and Singapore. He is the CEO of Coiners Group, the company behind Traffic, and a geolocation platform that uses augmented reality, blockchain technology, and gamification to reward people for living their lives. So um, James, welcome. The floor is yours. Oh, is my screen being shared or we're not? Yeah, we see. It Brilliant. Okie dokie. Okay, hi, my name is James Malik and I'm the founder of Trific, the world's first gamified rewards app which uses blockchain technology and cutting edge augmented reality to help revitalize the fortunes of local communities. Trific does this by gamifying the actions of our users and rewarding them with a cryptocurrency called GPS tokens. It requires no lifestyle changes whatsoever and, unlike most cryptocurrencies, it doesn't require the user to invest any of their own cash. Who remembers when their local town centre had its own unique character? It's probably not like that anymore. The mom and pop shops have been replaced by McDonald's, Subway and Starbucks and this has caused money which was traditionally redistributed locally to get siphoned out of communities. This can cause knock-on effects like rising unemployment and increases in crime, turning once vibrant towns into pale shadows of what they used to be. And that's where Trippet comes in. The user simply watches a short video advert which monetizes their session and then they receive an amount of time in which they get rewarded with GPS tokens whenever they move around. Trific rewards users based on the amount of effort they put into using the app or, to put it simply, somebody who walks, runs or cycles for one kilometre would get rewarded with more GPS tokens than somebody who's driven the same distance. And that makes it a great way to motivate people to exercise and stay healthy. And it also helps to reduce carbon emissions from uh, motorized transport. In addition, there are millions of special augmented reality reward beacons, which contain GPS tokens that can be found all over the world. If you've ever played Pokemon Go, then you'll already be familiar with the concept. The only difference is that instead of cute little monsters, what you're collecting has an actual monetary value. 
For those of you who don't know about Arda, it's a mature blockchain platform that has loads and loads of built-in features that make it much easier to build decentralized applications. Think how easy WordPress makes content management. Well, Arda is basically like WordPress, but for blockchain. GPS tokens originally started life as an asset on the Ignis child chain of ARDA and the great news is that they're being upgraded to a full child chain in quarter four of this year. One of the most exciting baked in features of our upcoming child chain is the monetary system, which lets businesses and services create their own branded and tokenized reward beacons, which can be placed in targeted areas to entice real physical customers to real physical locations. For example, a coffee shop could entice commuters to their venue with a beacon next to the local train station. A fitness center could place beacons outside fast food restaurants and offer a free trial to people who've just eaten that illicit double cheeseburger. For businesses which rely on attracting customers through their doors, as opposed to clicks to websites, advertising to people in the same geographic vicinity is much more effective than traditional and more expensive methods like SEO and pay-per-click. Even charities and community projects can benefit from Trific. In fact, during lockdown, our BT users raised over $2,000 for WHO COVID response by collecting augmented reality toilet rolls, hand sanitizers, and face masks. After more than three years of development, Trific launched to the public in June 2020. To ensure the viability of our long-term plans, we're very much focused on building up our worldwide user base at the moment, and we feel that our unique business model, which makes the acquisition of GPS tokens easy and risk-free, is a compelling proposition. Once the usage of GPS tokens has reached a critical mass, Trific's API-based design makes it easy to expand the ecosystem into a multitude of directions. For example, map-based applications like ride sharing, food delivery, and fitness and logistics tracking can be developed with ease, as can the creation of geolocated community currencies too. So please visit trific.app to learn more about what we do. We're still very much at the beginning of our journey, but we'd love to have you along for the ride. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks, James. Great presentation. Um, Thank you. Very nice idea as well. So uh, let me ask you a question. Privacy data concerns are on top of our minds today. So can you tell us about how you plan to use the user uh, location data and how this affects to the user privacy? Uh, yes, we're actually very, very aware of uh, companies like Google and Facebook that use people's uh, location uh, and they just uh, use them 24-7, they track them 24-7, everything like this. What we have actually managed to do is we have managed to monetize this and we are making the uh, data collection strictly opt-in. So basically, people are going to be paid a bonus if they agree to share the data, and if they don't agree to share the data, they can still use the app completely and utterly unhindered. They just don't earn as much as, uh, as if somebody actually shares their data. I see. So the data control is under the user. I, as a user, decide what to do with my data. Correct. And okay. if you, uh, and there'll be various levels as well. There'll be, uh, for example, aggregate sharing, which means that you don't uh, share anything personally identifiable. That'll mean you'll get this kind of bonus. Whereas if you uh, share sort of something more uh, identifiable, you'll get this kind of bonus or whatever. So it's very, very much up to the user how they want to share their data, if at all. Okay, great. Thank you, James. Very good. Um, so we go for the next presentation. Um, it's Thomas. It's from Thomas Wernbacher. Uh, Thomas, yes, thank you. You're uh, showing your video already. So Thomas is senior researcher at Donau University Krems and interested in doing research and conducting projects in the fields of mobility, health, education, and the environment. So in the intersection of all of that. 
um, Thomas uh, will present us uh, for um, the fourth startup today uh, called Cycle for Value. Thank you very much. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we see it. Okay, perfect. So my name is Thomas. I work at the Center for Applied Game Studies at Denver University, and I'm leading the project Cycle for Value. The following slide was already shown. It shows a map of the world and the temperature anomalies we are experiencing since some decades. And back in 2010, I started to think about how to use gamified technologies and gamified approaches to tackle climate change and to basically motivate people to cycle more. This picture was taken back in 2011 at Bike Citizens HQ, that's a partner in the project as well. You see two people sitting on gold sprint bikes trying to race as fast as possible. And at that time, the idea, the initial idea of the bike coin or cycle for value was born because these bikes are a perfect analogy. The idea was why can't people generate value by cycling instead of mining? Because at the time we could even mine Bitcoin using regular graphics cards. So the idea was to create an eco-friendly mode of value generation. For this project, we are using the other blockchain to build an incentive system, which is packed to cycling. So to ensure fair and health, health promoting mobility. We are also conducting a field test in Graz, Berlin, as well as Krems in order to assess the potential impact on the behavior. And the project itself and the framework is uh, transferable basically on a global level because the Back Citizens app works worldwide. As first step, we analyzed the positive effects of cycling. We conducted a meta-analysis, so analyzed a lot of studies and also conducted expert reviews. And in bold, you see the indicators we chose for the app. For instance, CO2, like emissions, traffic safety, and promotion of individual health. All this sums up to roughly 1.1 to euros per kilometer. So the idea is that the cycle token is packed to the euro. So one cycle token should be equal to one euro. Here you see how the system will work. So people cycle, they create value using the Back Citizens app, but in the future it should be possible to use other apps as well. We also apply like changes, machine learning in order to conduct a possibility check in order to avoid cheating. Then we apply a formula which is based on distance and frequency because we want to motivate people to use the bike on a daily basis. Then we run a mobile other node and a wallet which collects the cycle tokens. With the cycle tokens, you can go shopping on the marketplace for tickets, discounts. You can also use it for charity and for crowdfunding purposes and in order to get small incentives such as repair materials. But this is just uh, the first step of the project. In the future, we want to introduce the cycle token as a bike coin um, using as well the other blockchain because of its unique built in features. We chose the other blockchain because of its proof of stake algorithm, which is eco friendly. So you can operate it on a smartphone as mobile full node. So users will also be able to get the double reward. On the one hand, they will be able to get the cycle tokens by cycling. On the other hand, they can also take part in the other network by providing a smartphone as other node. So the idea will be to transform the cycle token into the bike coin and to make it exchangeable into other complementary currencies. For this, we're planning to use the child chain architecture of Ardo and we're also planning to use a new seed, the new seed feature of the Ardo client in order to manage the user accounts. The current stage of the project, we're kind of in the middle. We are currently creating the front end and the back end and building up the stakeholder board and the ecosystem, which will then accept the cycle token as currency. The project itself is founded by the Austrian ministry and project partners next to us are Y Traffic Planning, Bike Citizens and Saval Solutions. We are the project lead, then the University Krems, and they're looking forward to your feedback. So please feel free to ask me questions in the chat with the website or write me an email. I think that was quite fast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. It, was, it was really great. Maybe you can copy paste this uh, information and also put it in the chat so people can uh, just copy yeah, it sure. from, from mm -hmm. there. So 
let me ask you a question. What differentiates your approach from the other project we saw, mm -hmm. such from as Changes, Changes for instance? Com. Yeah, I think there are a lot of similarities, to be honest. But I guess what differentiates us is that we focus on cycling itself and not on the gamification part, but on the currency. So introducing the bike coin as real complementary currency. The second thing would be like the unique capabilities of the other blockchain, like this double reward system with creating or forging ardor as well as the cycle token. And that would be the second, the second thing that differentiates us. And the third thing I would say is like this idea of the Euro packed cycle token so that we really see the token itself as, as a real currency, which is based on the effects, like based on the meta analysis we conducted in order to provide the perfect basis to talk to companies, to talk to cities as well as the government so that they basically back the money we need in order to implement the currency itself and in order to provide users the opportunity to collect money by cycling. I see, I see, great. So since, since um, the COVID situation um, created this new cycling hype, um, how are you planning to use this momentum is 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 a good situation. Is a good momentum for you? It's really a good momentum because people cycle more. Uh, but it's also the problem. Like we have uh, in some cities, we have congestion, like cycling congestion. That's that's a thing. I didn't know that. And so we're working on a side project which basically uses the app in order to avoid crowds, so that the app picks the perfect route where you won't meet too many other cyclists. That's the side project we're currently working on. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you. Um, so our next presenter is Simon. Um, Simon, um, Simon is just, uh, Simon Wimmer is uh, just like Thomas, also a researcher at Donau University, um, Krems, and focuses on applied games studies. Simon will present us uh, the fifth startup called Ride to Park. Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. So um, I will talk for the next five minutes uh, about our project called Ride to Park, um, a voucher-based system for carpools. Um, and now I cannot go to the next slide and have to go back again. Okay. So first of all, um, the problem for the problem what we want to address is um, how to how can citizens contribute to social transformation for a climate friendly transport system and we have several obstacles um, in our way for example the people love their cars um, they asso associate them with uh, independence and freedom and also um, sometimes there isn't enough infrastructure for public transport um, for commuters um, okay and we have the solution um, we have a solution based on nudging, gamification, and validation. That's our Right to Park project. Um, without further uh, ado, I just go to the to the wireframe prototype. Um, in our project, um, one can always uh, decide every day on um, on a daily basis uh, if he or she wants to be the driver or the co-driver. If he or she um, decides to be a driver for the day. Um, he, he or she goes to uh, looks around or contact people who want um, to drive with him or her um, and find co-drivers. The co-drivers have to check in um, by scanning the QR code on the smartphone. So they have a face-to-face -face interaction um, where they have to check in that they are um, now a carpool. Um, and when they go to work, for example, because we target uh, computers, um, they have to check out again. So there will be at work or at the um, at the uh, at the parking lot um, will be um, tablets with um, daily new uh, generated QR codes where they can check out again. So we have a system where, without geofencing, just with check in, check out, um, we can. Uh, check if the people really drive together. And um, we want to, to give them incentives for doing so. So every co-driver um, gets with 
every write he or she um, takes um, um, takes part as a co-driver uh, gets a loyalty pass badge. And if they have enough of the um, reality pass pet batches, um, they get a small um, non non cash um, price. Um, for the drivers, we have a, a different system. It's called the lottery. So um, there are bigger prizes to win every week, and um, the the driver takes part in the lottery. And the chances to win in the lottery increase um, the more co-drivers they have in the car. So um, they, they have an incentive to fill the car with uh, as many co-drivers as possible. And also um, we have the, uh, something we call the reverse lottery. So every time uh, you don't win the, the lottery um, as a driver, you get at least a loyalty pass badge. That's just some wire frames how the gamification part works. We have the um, we have something like a level up system, so you can level up your carpool by um, offering more and more car sharing uh, drives and rides, and um, also um, how the, the reward system would look like. And also uh, something, um, some example how the, the nudging elements would work. So we just give some nice sentences um, on every loading screen, what you're doing good with um, carpooling. So the use case and the thing where you're all uh, interested, uh, what you're all interested in um, is the, of course, the blockchain imp implementation. So we want to do the check in and check out by using, by generating uh, utility tokens. So every time you uh, check in or check out, um, a token is generated. And we also use the, the other uh, blockchain because of the stake, uh, proof of stake um, algorithm and because, uh, because it's, just to energy efficient. And with that, we can um, avoid the geofencing, um, the geofencing thing. So we have, a, we, have, we, have, we have privacy by design by just um, work without the geo, geotext. Um, our current stage is that we had this idea at the Climaton in Graz. Um, and we are currently working on the conceptualization and the design and um, we're looking for funding. We estimate about 5K for a technical readiness level two and 30K for a prototype in technical re readiness level three. And last but not least, the team um, consists out of Thomas Wernbacher, um, who you know from the talk before, Konstantin Kraus and me, Simon Wimmer. Together, we call ourselves the Dundies. Uh, we're 100% self-founded and we follow the motto, social hacking for good. You can visit our website, um, www.dundies.at. And um, with that, let's achieve social change and not climate change. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation, Simon. Um, I wanted to ask you something. And so this project was born in that hackathon. So how was this experience for, for you? It's actually a new project, no? How long have you um, um, think is the project? So um, the idea for the project was uh, without the 24 hours hackathon. So we um, really worked. Uh, we started with knowing nothing about the, I mean, we, at least we, of course, we had some ideas about the problem, but we had no um, work before, we had not worked before on the problem, and we just got the challenge and worked on that for 24 hours, as you do in a hackathon. Um, for us, I think it was only 12 hours, because the first 10 hours, we had another idea, uh, which we uh, tossed away in, in, in a panic mode, some, some some in the middle of the night, I think that's also a typical thing for um, for hackathons. And yeah, it was it was a great experience, and I highly recommend for everyone who hasn't participated in a in a hackathon or a climathon, which is organized organized by Climate Kick and so also by EIT, um, to participate participate in something like that because it's just an an awesome way to bring out ideas in, in such little time and. Um, focus on one problem, so yeah. Very intense, I can imagine. And, and now with the current situation, with the, uh, with the COVID situation, how does COVID influence in the project? Because we are talking about putting together people in the car, yeah. people is yeah. afraid of a context, social context. That's a very interesting thing because um, yet 
as you as you mentioned, there's a shift um, from. On the one hand, we still want, of course, um, be eco-friendly and climate uh, climate friendly, and don't use um, don't use cars uh, sitting alone in a car. But on the other hand, of course, as you said, it's to some extent dangerous to um, be together in a car. And with that, I think that that's the thing we can. Um, really address with, with our system because we have the check-in, check-out system based on blockchain. So um, you check in and check out with the public ID. And if someone, and I think we were thinking about uh, implementing the feature, if someone shows symptoms after a certain uh, time, they can contact through the app um, people over their public ID. So it's to some extent anonymous. Um, to um, that they, um, in the in the most extreme for, um, case, um, to to self isolate them for at least uh, 14 days, and so be safe and still um, use the app and yeah, and be yeah, eco friendly and climate friendly. I see. Okay, and and the anonymous part is interesting as well because it's a public ID, and it doesn't. Um, 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 meet with the uh, real identity of the person. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Good, thank you very much. Um, thank you. So we go for the last presentation. Uh, Yuri, Yuri, can uh, you start switching on your video, please? Mm -hmm. um, Yuri is a growth-oriented visionary with a strong analytical and problem-solving skill set. She has 10 years of global experience in, in Asia, Pacific, Europe, and the US. She holds a bachelor's degree in engineering and a master of science of international business at Manchester Business School. Yuri will pitch Border X, a smart service uh, to declare priority shippings, right, Yuri? Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Let me set it up to presentation mode. Can everyone see this? Yes, we see your presentation. Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for Veronica and uh, Daniela for in, uh, inviting me for this uh, great event. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great to hear that uh, one of your other hackathon winning uh, project is also presenting. <laughs> so, um, our project uh, name is Border X. Uh, the long-term vision is to be the future of shipping in Europe. And uh, we are one of the uh, winning uh, projects from the EU versus Paris hackathon, which was just run in just few, three, min three months ago. Oh, sorry. Oh, so um, we have won this uh, hackathon and then after that, we are working on this, building this prototype. And then from the second uh, half, uh, already actually we started onwards, and we will start working on this uh, proof of concept. And then uh, next year we will uh, we plan to go live uh, with the official launch of our product. And so far we have this five nationalities of diverse uh, team, and then uh, uh, we have like 13 years of uh, tech experiences. And also we have this one advisor uh, who's has been actually working in the uh, cargo and the logistics industry for more than 25 years. So during this uh, hackathon time, uh, we spotted this uh, problem that there was a huge delay of, uh, of, of the truck uh, loading at the, um, at the borders. So um, like before there were like 75% of the freight transport was like in, is in the land base in Europe. But then uh, during this COVID time, there was severely affected because of this border closure. But then we also thought about how are we going to make this uh, idea and then presentable and then solve the problem for the long, for the long term, not only during the crisis time. So we did a little more research and then we found out that actually there were some seasonal peaks and heavy truck transit problems uh, during, uh, during the normal times actually. And that has been actually having a problem in the past decade. Uh, so we thought, okay, this is uh, the right problem that we wanted to jump in. And then also next year, when the COVID vaccines are uh, developed and ready to be delivered, 
then you know that vaccines needs to be delivered to every household or hospitals and governments like as soon as possible. So at the time, the uh, the the shipping and then the shipping shipping of the efficient road management of the shipping will be most important, which we we studied. Uh, so yeah, so that's why we we decided to develop this idea and then present to the world. Um, so uh, main key characteristic of our idea actually is based on the uh, advantages of the blockchain technology. Uh, so blockchain technology, which today actually talked about a lot that uh, we have, there are a lot of various uh, key advantages like immutable data management and the trackability and so on and so forth. And in our model, we decided to focus on the auditability feature of the blockchain. Um, and that enables this hassle-free handling of the goods and informed decision making, whoever controlling and managing the data trans, trans data, um, data part, and then also the uh, securely encrypted, managed by the blockchain technology, and easy to set up by using the flexible API approaches that uh, you don't need to integrate the entire software or something, but uh, just by communicating through API uh, with our blockchain uh, services, that, uh, that's actually uh, removing a lot of the initial uh, barrier to utilize and adopt this uh, new kind of technology. Uh, so uh, I wanted to present the simple like financial sector use cases to everyone. Uh, so the first part is the COVID-19 the insurance part. So uh, when this uh, our system is set up right, then uh, we can help to streamline the audit and declaration processes. And also uh, during this crisis time, there were very flexible taxation were applied, like some medical goods, for example, got these special cases and some of the goods are actually have the tax, uh, tax exemption. So at the end of the day, after the crisis, especially all these companies need to uh, declare all these information. So at the time we can sit in and then we can help to process and facilitate these information. And how before that, before the financial sector exemptions come in, uh, how we, uh, so this is an idea that we actually presented at this uh, University Spiral Hackathon. Um, so we thought this uh, priority shipping model could be workable at the efficient uh, road management. So for example, uh, when you look at this, the first line, uh, when the truck is coming in and then uh, you can say uh, it can be it can be actual border or it can be any kind of checkpoint within the road. So um, when the car is passing through that checkpoint, uh, when all the information is declared right and it's accredited, and also all the matching signals, for example, the company name code is right, rightly set up, then um, the 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 checkpoint manager will only see the pass light, and then since the um, all the information has been already uh, declared and processed, you can uh, let this trust go. And if you want to make it as the automated system like, um, uh, like a truck number plate, uh, scanning can be also integrated into the system. So in that case, you don't even have to have an uh, actual person who, who's actually waiting or grabbing the trucks on the road. And then second part is uh, when some parts are not, not accredited and then some parts are saying that the uh, matching signals are not matching, then, then the person, the checkpoint manager will see the check and then the person can um, stop the truck and then just check the important information. And here the key is that you don't have to check all this entire information. You can only check those uh, uh, having the red flag. Like in this second case, if the matching signal is not right, then only the documents relevant to this particular issues can be checked. And then the last part is when none of the information is done right, then it will show the stop messages, then all these trucks will get fined. So uh, we were, our project will be like, you know, it's, uh, it's solving the problem in combination of the both shipping and also the road management and more, more making the road, road uh, traffic as efficient as possible. So let me show you the quick uh, demo with this screenshot. So, um, so as a checkpoint manager, how you check this information is that you can see this number plate code. So when this number plate code is uh, scanned, and after that, this the below information will be appearing. That will show this previous border closing expected. 
and then uh, some information not credited. So in this case, this truck needs to be stopped and then needs to, uh, the information, necessary information needs to be checked. And then as a, the, the, we call it as a courier. So as those who's actually delivering any kind of the shipments, uh, they need to pre-accredit the information, which you can see here. And then also high priority information needs to be declared. And high priority information is more relevant to, you know, the critical goods like medical goods or um, in some cases that could be um, like food or some, uh, some goods that requires the limited uh, time until from the departing point to the end the destinations. Yeah, so uh, in this case, we, our uh, demo shows a different country, but also it can be, as I said earlier, it can be the different spots within the city or be between multiple states, if, if, we, if it's a German example. And how we wanted to, how we are utilizing this uh, DLT as in the blockchain technology is uh, we utilize this immutable data transfer and then uh, trusted entities that they can be easily implemented not only uh, by using you know, the paper-based documents, but also we support and encourage the digital, digitization of the whole entire process. And then when that information is digitized, then uh, we, uh, we secure this information, not only using the blockchain security model, but also uh, we are applying this uh, human network to double confirm that information, whether, they, whether or not that's right and uh, flexibility and also data security. So yeah, you can see simple our data model. So uh, as uh, you, you've just seen in the demo, like couriers model on the left side, all this information is keyed in, and then this information will be, uh, will be packaged into, this, into the one blockchain signature, and then there will be published token. And then that will go into the block, border access blockchain network, and then on the other hand is the border control site, which is also the checkpoint control site. We'll just need to scan this number plate. Then uh, they will be given this like a uh, high level of the secure uh, signature, which means that high level of the um, access is given to this particular key, uh, which will be like in the blockchain industry, we, we say that it's a hashing, hashing key, which is like a, like a long line of the random numbers. Yeah. So with that number, you, the border or uh, the checkpoint managers will have an access to the, all the information and then they will see the pass and control and then, yeah, and then that's the end of the transaction. So yeah, this is a basic uh, blockchain model of uh, block border X. Okay. And our go-to-market strategy is uh, during the phase one this year, uh, we, are, uh, we can uh, practice our system in one checkpoint, which will involve two parties. And then the phase two will be one route, which will involve the multiple parties, which means that the two or three checkpoints that can be conducted. And then the last phase will be the multi-route, which means that the full route of the shipping from the departing and the end point. And then this is a roadmap of, uh, of our plan until 2023. 20, so yeah. <laughs> And then, yeah, so we, we are the five team that uh, was from the hackathon and um, yeah, we are very looking forward to see how this project can go and we need your help for uh, initially trying out this uh, initial implementation and I'm happy to answer for any questions if you have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yuri. Um, yeah. So great presentation, a very young pro project. Um, so what are you looking for right now? Where is your focus going to be in the coming months? Yeah, so we were actually part of this uh, marathon was after this EU versus virus hackathon. There were the following up events, which was more focusing on the matchmaking event. So we were currently talking to some, uh, yeah, we spoke to the like, ministries and then the corporations and some research organizations as well. So um, if you're interested in, it would be great to talk uh, about some initial like pilot program that we could yeah, potentially run this and then test it out. And uh, uh, yeah, so we can work together and how to, we can actually help to improve this, uh, yeah, this uh, 
did um, improve the industry from using our idea. <laughs> Okay, very ambitious project. You need to bring on a lot of players to make it happen. So feel free to, to share your contact details in the chat, uh, Yuri. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. And now, Daniel, can we launch the second poll to the audience? Um, yeah, well, I will do it. Let's go. Thank you. And, and now we are going to start um, uh, with our panel of discussion. So together with Philip uh, and the startups presenters, we have uh, uh, with us Maria Minarikova and Lior Jaffe. Uh, Maria, Lior, Philip, can you turn on your videos, please? Maria is involved in the development of the state of the art tech applications using blockchain and uh, artificial intelligence as part of solutions for DeFi, which is decentralized finance, autonomous supply chains, smart cities, mobility, energy. Um, she's head of business development at Fetch AI, chair of board and founding member of Blockchain for Europe, and an active member of the UR, UA Blockchain Observatory. Hello, Maria. It's a pleasure to have you today with, with us. Hello, Veronica. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's been really interesting talk so far, so I'm, I'm glad to be here and uh, hopefully I can add some, some other interesting bits to it. Great. Thank you, Maria. Um, Lior Jaffe is an entrepreneur, an engineer with over 20 years of experience and a blockchain for developers since 2013 for NXT and Ardor and he's co-founder and director at Gelurida. Um, this blockchain company offers blockchain platform in infrastructures, and Lior has participated in the development of NXT, the first 100% proof of stake blockchain, and also Ardor, the first production multi-chain platform. Lior is the creator of the first smart contracts built in Java called Lightweight Contracts, and he's involved in several research initiatives um, and also writes in Medium and participates in relevant blockchain media articles from time to time. Hello, Lear. Welcome to the event. Thank you, Veronica. It's a pleasure to have you here. All. So um, I have you uh, the three of you here. Uh, let's start the discussion. So my, fir my first question would be for Philip. And Philip, what are the biggest challenges that the mobility industry is facing right now and the blockchain technology can help? Oh, you are mute. You are right, sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I, think the, um, I think it really depends on which companies within the mobility industry you're talking to, especially um, with Corona. If you're talking with large-scale uh, mobility companies, you know, automo automotive suppliers, the, the OEM car manufacturers, you know, everything is really stuck because of Corona. It doesn't make sense to talk to them at this point of time because it just doesn't move uh, currently. Uh, if you talk to startups, then you have a higher degree of movement, but you have no access to infrastructure. And at some point of time, these companies might also run out of money. Um, so therefore, it's it's not an easy situation, especially when you are relying on companies uh, who are large, who are having, um, who have been uh, hit uh, strongly by Corona. Um, we see this, for example, in in, in Germany uh, with the with these large scale companies. So therefore, that's um, a, a development, especially here, in, um, related to these companies, slows down and also on behalf of startups selling to such companies at this point of time doesn't really make sense um, because uh, budgets are being stalled and so on. Yeah, that need, that needs, needs a couple of months until this uh, um, might be um, in a better mood, uh, I would guess so. And uh, blockchain right now can help on various way, but um, as I have shown previously, um, the technology blockchain is quite in a very, very early stage. And we cannot expect that the technology uh, is able to produce live systems right now. We are very often still in the mode where we are having prototypes, um, first uh, numbers of products running on a blockchain, but it's not, com not 
countrywide networks uh, which are running things on a blockchain basis so that for this the technology is simply not ready yet and uh, maybe the technology is ready from a technological perspective but the companies who would like to apply it they are not ready yet and i think the biggest threat at this point of time is that you have um, uh, not enough knowledge what the technology can do exactly with those people who are having the budget so people up in the hierarchy senior managers maybe 60 plus uh, and so on it's these people who have the budget but it's also these people who at this point of time uh, do not have sufficient knowledge yet about blockchain technology such that uh, they cannot do informed decisions concerning budgets and that's a little bit of a problem because then the technology doesn't really move we see this multiply with banks and also with um uh, with industrial companies com co corporations at this point of time this will change once education takes place um, uh, also in uh, with senior managers but uh, the technology hasn't really diffused yet and therefore that's the last remark from for the first question here um, I think what I'm just saying uh, should not be meant in a bad way, not at all. What we are just seeing here is the early stage of a technology with, which is diffusing and just takes a while until all the geeks and freaks and startup guys, until they have um, explained their um, technology to those people in senior positions who have the budget, who needs to understand it, but it takes a while. So education indeed is one of the main um, fights we should uh, uh, take care of. Uh, um, Maria, do you agree with that? What is your point of view? Yeah, I fully agree with Philip, uh, very well summarized. Um, so yes, the technology, uh, so first of all, we were hit with COVID and it just uh, disrupted the whole world, right? It's not just the blockchain or not, you know, but it just, it's, it's, disrupted all industries, all of our lives, um, everything. Uh, and it put priorities, you know, obviously in a, in a different area. Uh, but it also showed us, uh, you know, where we lack, uh, you know, uh, what's lacking, you know, transparency, uh, that we can uh, have so many more improvements in terms of supply chain, you know, uh, and various other things, right? So uh, I would agree with, with Philip that uh, technology is currently still in a, in a development. It's very early stages. So, so that, that needs to continue, but it can only continue if there's enough emphasis and there is enough interest uh, from the funding bodies, whether it's uh, you know, private investors or also uh, I would say um, national funding uh, bodies, uh, national or European, European Commission. Uh, should uh, should continue, you know, showing the interest in in, in this area and and to keep us uh, on the front of, of this technological development because this is one of the technologies of the future um, and we cannot stop, you know, we cannot take a break for a couple of years and and think that uh, the startups will somehow survive that uh, the whole thing will be put on hold and we can just pick up, you know, a couple of years later. Um, so you know, developments need to continue. Uh, but I also think uh, what, uh, so adoption, absolutely readiness is, are we ready for that? Even if we have the technology, is the society ready? Um, are the corporations, large, you know, companies ready for, for the adoption? Uh, because uh, blockchain changes the way we look at things, the way we do things from centralization, centralized uh, uh, programs or centralized, um, you know, way of doing things to, to decentralized. So there won't be any, you know, particular, um, uh, one platform that can now aggregate all, you know, all the, um, uh, all of the players. So this, this, you know, everybody's going to, to have their own way of doing things. Um, what, what wasn't mentioned so far was actually regu regulation. So uh, the regulation is very important and the companies uh, that are developing in this space, the technologies that are being, de being developed need to uh, be, uh, you know, need to follow regulations. Um, and so that is uh, that has actually sped up recently. Um, there's a lot of development coming um, out of European Commission, um, several consultations uh, around the crypto assets, around stable coins. So, so these uh, what we're what we're looking to have is actually clear focus uh, and clear um, directions from the regulators, from the policymakers on you know what is allowed and and how we're uh, allowed to function uh, as industries, but also as consumers. Uh, and and uh, I fully agree, uh, what is absolutely mostly needed is, is more education, building knowledge uh, in among the industries, uh, blockchain industries, other industries, 
uh, within the regulators. And uh, that's also why, so I'm part of Fetch AI, but what, why we have also funded, um, co-funded the Blockchain for Europe Association. So we're uh, building this dialogue between the industry, the blockchain industry, other industries, and, and the regulators and policymakers to really make them understand that, uh, you know, what this technology is capable of doing, uh, what will be the benefits, and what are also the challenges that we're seeing. Mm, I see, I see. Lior, um, what do you think from your perspective, from the technical side, you are sitting on the other side of the table, you are a developing blockchain solution since 2013, and it's a complex technology, so how do you see um, this? Yeah, so, so I wouldn't say that the technology is just starting. After all, Bitcoin, the first implementation of blockchain was launched in 2009. That's more than 11 years ago. So in software terms, it's uh, forever. So we are now, but what we realized is that there are two fundamental problems uh, that uh, prevent mainstream adoption or, or slow mainstream adoption. One uh, aspect is the client side behavior, the user interface. People are not used to own their private key and never lose it. We always assume that someone out there is going to reset our password and everything will be back to normal. But this is not like this in blockchain. In blockchain, if you own the key, you own whatever the application suggests. If you lose it, it's lost forever. For good or bad, that's the aspect of decentralization, that you're responsible to your own keys. Now, the engineers developing blockchain are doing a lot of work to provide some uh, recovery mechanism. Just to name two simple examples, is that you can start from one seed and generate... Vale. En general, esto está acabando, está, acabamos a, a y media eh, y hemos quedado y media con el proceso, ¿vale? Perfecto, muy bien. Is not mute. Okay, Dani, you are not mute. Ah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, so so, so one um, what one uh, trick that we you can do is uh, create one seed, secure seed and derive from it an endless stream of private keys that you can share with your users. And then you, you as a seed holder um, uh, can recover these uh, private keys in case your users lost it. Of course, this also allows you to control the user account. So there is always a trade-off. Um, you can, but what about this seed? What happens if it's lost? So there is a, a cool trick to split a, a seed or a secret into Uh, several pieces that only some of them need are needed in order to reproduce a secret. So, um, so this gives you a way to back up and, and gives you some redundancy. A combination of these technologies uh, give, gets you pretty, pretty far uh, with respect to, uh, to user experience, but of course to get this mainstream into mobile app, into an online wallet and so on is a lot of work. The other aspect, just briefly, is about scalability. The, the first generation of blockchains were single chain, um, single token of value in the case of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. But clearly everybody understands right now that this approach does not scale. So, um, so, so the scaling solutions are either on-chain by splitting the chains into uh, structures of multiple chains, like we do in Ardo, or uh, using off-chain solutions where you can save some of the information off the blockchain and only use it to prove, some, only use the blockchain to prove some statements. On top of that, there's a lot of research and work on cryptography that will uh, make this uh, more uh, mainstream. Mm -hmm. So that that's, um, shows a real big challenge to to put together the technical part with the business part and with the public administrations, the governments, and all the stakeholders of the mobility industry, right? Um, and we have the results of the poll. Um, Daniel, um, can you share, please, the results? 
Yeah, so we asked the audience to vote uh, based on the information given if uh, in which projects do you think the blockchain technology is crucial and this is the the results so um, in the border X project uh, it's 58% things that is cru crucial the, that was a multi-choice uh, uh, question, so people could vote different uh, options as well, several. Tango Tech with a 39, Changers with 33, Trific and Up and Psyche for Value 33, and Right to Park 21. Thank you so much for participating in this uh, pool. Um, yeah, so we can continue our panel. Um, so, Daniel, we, do we have um, any question from the audience or we can continue? Yeah, I think we have some questions from the audience. I think one I think I will address to Philip is regarding taxation. Um, how it will work the taxation in this, uh, transitory, tra in this monetary transactions that you already were talking to us. Is Europe mm -hmm. ready for that? Um, also in my personal opinion, it's it's not so much of a uh, of a difficult issue. I th also, um, I think nowadays people who are owning crypto assets know how they are taxed. You know, in any country, in case you are plugging the euro on top of a blockchain and making something being paid, um, then this this is of course not tax because that's payment but the question is what are you paying for this might be um, a service then it's related to a utility token then it's for example value added tax or it might uh, be something else um, um, i think I, i'm not a true tax expert but my feeling is that most of the rules are pretty clear it's just difficult to execute and implement these rules especially for example in the uh, value added tax uh, regime depending on the tax number and the country of, um, of the customer and so on, you have like huge complications about what exact value added tax rate you are applying. So that makes it difficult from an implementation perspective, um, but still the rules are at least there. I, I don't see so much of an issue that, um, that that's a gap which needs to be filled. Also, but maybe I'm wrong, maybe somebody else has a, has a uh, more deeper opinion here. I would say that um, we are just in the very early stage. There are huge promises, huge possibilities ahead for companies, for startups, for people. Um, and the, 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 the huge bottleneck at this point of time is um, budget, such that projects are being proceeding. Um, and, um, and if you dig a little bit deeper, it's not really budget, which is the problem, but it's education, which is lacking, same as Maria has said without education, people don't understand the technology. And the point is the following, maybe this needs to be emphasized, blockchain technology is a complicated technology. Um, watching a YouTube video or having a lecturer being invited who holds two hours of a presentation, that's not enough. Uh, for blockchain technology, I guess you, you need to invest four weeks of work full time, and maybe this is not even enough, maybe you need eight weeks of works uh, of full-time work and then you are understanding the key principles of smart contracts and so on so um, i think that's that's really a problem because people who are busy especially also senior managers they cannot simply take eight weeks and educate themselves uh, uh, in full depth you know that's that's a systematic issue um, and and therefore we i think the, it was, would be most pressing to somehow solve um, this topic of education to have more people understanding it in all kinds of companies and hierarchy levels because uh, because the, the proof is the following once people are understanding blockchain technology they see the promises and they like it and they would like to work in this area and so on or the other way around try to find one person who have understood the blockchain technology who does not like it yeah try to find such persons there are not many out there once people understand it they like it and if they do not like it, then we can assume that they have not really digged deep enough, to be honest. Um, that's pretty clear, same with Bitcoin. And therefore, um, I think education needs to be improved somehow. Yeah. 
Okay, I think we as a uh, urban mobility, we take this, okay, because uh, we are also uh, investing in education uh, because we think that this is the way in order to transform and to innovate. Thank you. I think I have no, I have another question. Maybe if we have more time, Veronica, I will, I will. We, we give it later. Ma Maria, you wanted to? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I fully agree with Philip. And uh, again, so I think we're all on the same page. I think what's, what's new, what, what this uh, technology, what blockchain brings, uh, this new concept of peer-to-peer -peer transactions, uh, which are not just information uh, exchange, right? But it's a value exchange. And the fact uh, that is really uh, great for mobility is that you can now um, you can now have machines uh, having these machine to machine transactions. So this is the new concept that people don't don't really understand. Um, so um, imagine you know uh, you're driving uh, and you have a car and your car will actually con communicate with the parking lot on your behalf and will find the right parking lot in the right place. Uh, not only that, but it will also uh, make the negotiation with the parking lot for the price, for the availability. We'll, we'll do all this booking for you, and then we'll set, it will settle the transaction um, on the blockchain. Uh, and you can expand this into you know, cars, uh, electric vehicles, and the charging systems, uh, and all these different parts of, that are there for mobility. And um, so I think this is this is so, such a new concept that uh, that people don't quite understand how how uh, how this will really change our lives in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And difficult implementation as well. Yeah, so it, not so, not so difficult. I think people just haven't tried it enough. So um, uh, you know, I I think people people get scared. Yes, and it's new. Just like Philip said, you know, it takes some time to to really get to know it and to understand that, but. Um, I wouldn't say it's, you know, that much more difficult when, than some of the other technologies. Um, yeah. Another point is that um, actually blockchain technology doesn't make sense if you do it alone. You always need companies to collaborate because by definition, it does not make sense to have a company-owned blockchain network. Your, uh, blockchain is by definition across organizations. And that makes it so complex because you have to sit down with other people from other companies, which you first have to find, and you have to sit down, define standards and common ground. Uh, and, uh, and this makes it partly extremely tedious, also in the financial uh, area where blockchain makes extremely much sense. Uh, but people need to sit down, agree on a standard, and, and of course, um, with a couple of large-scale organizations um, behind yourself, uh, it takes months until you have found a common ground such that you then can implement something. Um, Maria, I think you could you would agree here because you you are also having such consortiums in place, and then you see also that sometimes um, things are just difficult because of standardization reasons. but also uh, this new concept of cooperation. So instead of having you know uh, just competitive platforms. What we're doing with blockchain is actually bringing everybody into the same space uh, and removing sort of like the platforms. And, and yes, you can have several blockchains uh, and there will need to be interoperability. You know, that, that still needs to uh, be developed. But what we're going to create is this one large ecosystem of all these different players, um, like a new digital world, uh, where they can find each other, they can communicate with each other. Um, and uh, they're not necessarily competing with each other or, or they can compete, but they also need to collaborate, uh, which is a very new concept and, and companies are just not used to that, right? And so, um, so it's a societal you know, change, but again, it, it all comes down to, to education and, and understanding it. Um, and when you have a larger pie, also your slice is larger, right? And so, so um, this all needs to be really well understood and, and um, um, so we need more education. That's a very interesting point you were saying, Philip, because um, and blockchain is about collaboration and is about decentralization, is about having a lot of nodes, maintaining this uh, common database. Uh, but but uh, sometimes the implementations we see are private blockchains, or sometimes the companies are afraid to participate in public blockchains. Um, and, and, and Leo, what do you think about that? Uh, because you are uh, genuinely in the public blockchain space and, and, and some companies are sometimes reluctant to, to participate in this public blockchain because they cannot control it, right? 
Yes, I, I think that for blockchain technology to reach its uh, maximum potential, we have to use uh, public blockchains and not just closed uh, groups of uh, uh, companies uh, cooperating using a blockchain. There are use cases for that, but it's, it will not reach the full potential of blockchain that, for example, lets you put a value on very, very small uh, actions. Two, uh, two cars, two autonomic, autonomic cars standing in traffic, communicating between themselves uh, uh, or, or cooperating on one is broadcasting, I'm going to freeze this parking. Uh, you can go in there, get some tokens. These things are never going to work in this closed consortium because the, the closed, uh, the private blockchains, and we've seen it before, they will immediately start to, uh, um, to fight who owns the platform, who is allowed to get the data and so on. Uh, the, the public blockchain is like the big uh, equalizer. It lets everybody cooperate on the same level, on the same ledger. That's, a, that's why I'm a big believer in, uh, uh, in public uh, blockchain. Yeah, I can talk about that. I fully agree with that. Uh, the ecosystem of mobility, where you have uh, very many players, independent players, uh, coming in, leaving this ecosystem, you know, we, have, we travel abroad, so it cannot be, you know, it cannot be done on a private blockchain. It, it just doesn't scale. Um, so uh, Gartner predicted that in 2020, we're going to have, uh, so this year, we're going to have 20 billion IoT devices. Um, now, uh, what, what Philip said is it's not just blockchain, it's really the combination of these new emerging technologies. So and that's actually what we're doing at Fetch. I didn't mention that. So we're looking at the convergence of AI and blockchain and IoT as well. Uh, and basically uh, giving uh, autonomy to, um, so we're creating, we have created a framework for autonomous agents to, to be able to represent people, IoT devices, uh, organizations, and to be able to communicate together uh, and negotiate and transact together autonomously on behalf of their owner. So like, you, you know, this enables the, the machine to machine economy, as, as we said. Um, and this large ecosystem really needs to be done on the open public blockchain if you really want to realize the full benefits of that. Philip, what do you think about that? Do you think uh, we are ready for uh, the industry, the companies are ready for this uh, switch of mindset, for this new paradigm of collaboration? That's an interesting question. So I would, um, what we see, you know, um, well, I, I mainly know now uh, German companies, and here we see that uh, uh, um, German companies traditionally are uh, sometimes um, very, very, yeah, very slow and and uh, very hierarchical, and that makes them extremely slow. For example, if you take a company such as Siemens, you know they are extremely slow, very bureaucratic. Uh, uh, doesn't really move. It's like the opposite of agile, to be honest. And uh, it's it's exactly this management style, which worked for decades, but um, it's it's not made for our current world, where where the the only thing what really matters is speed, um, with the side condition of a sufficient uh, quality. Yeah, that's why the U.S. companies and all the startups and so on they can be re very successful because they just outcompete. Uh, legacy organizations with uh, speed. Take Tesla versus uh, the entire uh, legacy world of automotive manufacturers. That's exactly the case. Suddenly, has, uh, Tesla has uh, suddenly, suddenly Tesla is the most valuable automotive company on the planet. You know, nobody has ever thought this. How did they do it with IT and with speed and with not being perfect on quality, but with being at least sufficiently good? Yeah, that's my impression. And therefore, I think. Um, what um, I think um, like older organizations really need to be careful that they are um, not outliving themselves because they are just too slow to compete with companies who then are much faster. Um, but it doesn't, and that's what I wanted to say, it doesn't really matter in terms of size because you also can have huge organizations in terms of numbers of employees, you know, like take Chinese organizations um, or also uh, Amazon, for example, that's companies they have, 10,000s of employees, they are huge, but they are structured and organized in a way that they can be very, very, very speedy and agile. Now, Amazon, 
for sure being the prime example. And um, and I think in a world where, where speed uh, is increasingly mattering, I think um, traditional organizations really need to worry about um, the question, are they speedy enough to compete or can they be outpaced by other smaller ones or more, more agile ones? And the other one is, um, do they really understand IT in a sufficient way? And I feel if we talk about German OEM manufacturers like BMW, Daimler, and so on, they don't have really understood uh, IT uh, deeply. Um, what you see with Tesla and other companies, you know, that's brilliantly designed uh, IT, great UI when you drive um, a Tesla. And basically, that's my state of knowledge, which is five years old. And in, I also drive a BMW and the, the navigation system, you can't really use it. You know, that's technology from the 80s. Um, and it doesn't change. Um, and therefore, I feel that um, that companies are partly not ready for this IT um, flash, which is coming to us. Uh, and that's very dangerous because suddenly you have the car and the human being. And in between, you will have an electronic device that's, that is the monitor in the Tesla or that's the smartphone which you are having in hand. And suddenly, I am um, interacting with an electronic device coming from Asia or the US and I'm only in the second order um, interacting with an, I don't know, car produced in Germany. And that's not just happening in the automotive area, that's also in the area of engineering, medical technology, and everywhere uh, where IT will go into these products. And very often I would argue that, uh, like at, at least what I see in Germany, the companies are not ready for this IT flash, which, which is already coming to us. Yeah, that's really, an, very, very honest threat. And blockchain is just one, one aspect of this uh, uh, IT intensity which is coming. Do you think uh, that this is a cultural uh, issue? Because you are talking about the US, Europe, China, you mentioned China in your presentation, uh, and how fast they are moving towards digitalization of their uh, currency. Um, so is this a cultural uh, thing? Mm, partly, yes, actually. I, I think, you know, China is different because they just do it top down. Yeah, they define IT as a priority, then they define a budget, and then they execute it uh, extremely efficiently, right? Uh, but that, and that with this, it's a cultural issue because um, in Europe, we have more this consensus-oriented uh, culture, um, thinking that the market somehow produces a good solution. Um, and the US uh, companies, they are also by culture more agile and more IT intensive anyway. But I think more important is the following uh, aspect. It, it once again comes back to education. Because if people are educated and educate themselves, and also if universities and teachers are educating their uh, pupils and their students um, with digital stuff um, and education and so on, then young people will have the knowledge to feel that IT is important, and then this will be also carried into the organizations. But this is not happening. If you look at universities, if you look at schools, that's the opposite of what's uh, digital. And if you look uh, at what happened with Corona, then uh, luckily a couple of universities moved their education now online. That's, that's good. Uh, but it was a very, very, very hard process for every person being involved. And if you look at German schools, nothing is digital. Uh, during COVID and Corona, uh, lectures, uh, lect like teachers took their bike, printed paper, and uh, uh, have put paper in the uh, postal box of their pupils um, in the villages. You know, that's, that's basically how German teachers sometimes handled Corona. That's, again, the opposite of uh, digitization. And with such an attitude, I think you cannot educate people in IT then they don't understand digitization, and then they don't bring this knowledge into the companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, that, and, and therefore, I, I honestly think education is, uh, is the, the, the biggest issue here. Mm -hmm. Education is repeating. Um, Daniel, maybe we can uh, um, launch the third and, and final poll. While I'm gonna invite the presenters of the startups um, to switch on their video so they can and show in the presentation and please um so i want to ask you all and uh, please be concise and, and and direct in your question so we have time for everyone 
what has been the greatest challenge you are facing during your journey? We want to hear from you um, in person. Andres, can you start? Uh, well, I think it's, it's one of the points that has been commented the most uh, by, by the previous uh, speakers is the point that blockchain requires, obviously, a, in, I mean, requires cooperation between the different parties. It requires cooperation. We are in a B2B, we are purely B2B uh, uh, platform, and we work with different corporations. And at the end, to, in order to get the maximum result of what we are doing of our projects, uh, of our pilot, or, or even going to production, it's very important that the companies are agree on the terms to cooperate and to have it clear and to be open. And that's, that's a chain of mind for a lot of them because it's, it's something that they are not used to. They think that sometimes they think that a lot of the things are, are private information that they don't want to share. They don't, sometimes they don't understand that there are better ways to be more efficient. So I will say that the, mo the most important challenge as a blockchain, pure blockchain company that we what we sell services based on blockchain is to really convince or to make this change of mind that more information for every, everyone means more efficient and more efficient in reality is good for all the different actors at the same time. So it's, it's positive to have this share of information in uh, mm -hmm. chain that is secure. That will be. Um, so as, as a B2B per, per, uh, company, you're doing a lot of evangelization all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In mm -hmm. three long years of evangelization. Yes, okay. Daniela, what about you? What are the greatest challenges in your journey? Um, I think it's, it's the same as, as with everyone. So on the one side, of course, you have the ecosystem. So the chicken and egg problem. Um, you really have to get people involved and then it has to grow. And, and how do you get partners on board if there is not that much there yet? classical uh, marketplace um, um, issue or, or ecosystem issue. And um, then I think it's also uh, compliance is something that is quite important, um, especially if we are looking at our, uh, at our business clients. If we would start, for example, to make the tokens fungible for, for them, so exchangeable into euros or dollars, um, compliance and corporate lawyers would freak out because how do you how do you um, 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 see this is this is a reward is this part of the salary how do you calculate this so all of a sudden there is like all these huge issues that would pop up, pop up. and so for example we don't do this yet yeah. and hope that hopefully soon there's going to be a solution for that right right Thomas what about you well basically it's the same challenges Daniela or changes are facing and I would add that, especially for cycling, if you look at the positive effects of cycling, it's the question of how and when the government will take money in their hands and basically provide a backing of this 1.12 euros per kilometer, which cycling produces as value on a collective level as well as a personal level. That's mm -hmm. the biggest challenge. It will mean a lot of money, of course, but the positive effects are really impressive and I hope that they will recognize this uh, in course of the project phase. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. Uh, James, what do you think? What are you uh, well, about? the biggest challenges for us, I guess, I mean, first of all, uh, simplifying what we were doing was uh, very big. I mean, uh, at the beginning, we tried to be almost like all things to all people, and all it really did was confuse people. Uh, we had uh, uh, um, some people trying to claim that we were like a, a, uh, a blockchain-based Uber or a blockchain-based Booking.com, which had nothing to do what we, with what we were doing. It was just we sort of mentioned this. So what we're doing is we're taking things like in easy bite-sized chunks and uh, doing things like that. The other challenge that we had was uh, we're an app that um, is. Uh, promotes people to move about, go outside and everything like this. And when lockdown came, uh, it kind of curtailed all that. So uh, we were faced with our beta testing, people that suddenly weren't allowed to go out or anything like this. And we actually turned a minus into a plus. And uh, we brought forward a feature, which was basically about being able to... Um, 
to almost like to send augmented reality uh, models to people's houses and things like this. So uh, we uh, started beaming these um, uh, like uh, augmented reality toilet papers, uh, face masks, hand sanitizers, and ended up raising money for charity and testing out the very, very powerful function of our app as well. So uh, everything that we've been challenged with, we've uh, hopefully been able to turn into a positive. Okay, great. Simon, what about you? What are the greatest challenges you're facing in your journey? Um, I think the most, the greatest uh, challenge just came up um, with Corona because a half year ago, um, if you talked about carpooling, everyone would say, okay, yeah, definitely um, sharing a car and not driving with three cars, but one. Um, is a good thing. And now it's just, okay, you're talking about putting four, four or five people in one car. So the, the, the culture on that just shifted completely. And I mean, we addressed the problem and I think blockchain um, technology just did a, does a very great thing on, on especially at this point. That, but on the other hand, we have to advertise our system with the risk of getting um, infected but on the other hand at least you know the people um, and you can contact the other people but you you have to advertise with a negative thing to some extent so I think this is a big challenge but on the other hand it's it's a feature to yeah. some extent it's you, an opportunity yeah, yeah it's exactly. just like like uh, Maria was also pointing as well that uh, everything is stopped for this crisis and everything mm. is readjusting and the startups might suffer in their journey. Um, Yuri, uh, what are the greatest challenges you are facing right now? Yeah, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, yeah, in my case, so I think mainly finding you know the right partners. I think that would be the main challenges. Uh, I know that blockchain and everything is can be actually quite overwhelming for many industry partners, uh, but. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, the, what we can do as a technology company, I think we can just make the, the use of the technology as easy as possible. And also today we talked a lot about education. I think education is still the very important topic. And uh, yeah, I, in the past few years, I was also like, in, in, having been in a blockchain industry, also spoke with a lot of industry partners. My, personally, I feel that, um, Education has been always emphasized, and then we still need to, you know, focus on and also as blockchain is developing and industry is developing, and then we can evolve all together. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to see how, you know, <laughs> you can, <coughs> I, as a personal, personal blockchain advocate as well, so how it holds uh, an entire industry ships with a good use of the blockchain. Yeah. yeah. So, Philip, Maria, Lior, after hearing all these challenges uh, from mm, the persons who are running and these uh, innovative projects, um, what do you think we need uh, to help uh, facilitate mm. the adoption of these projects mm. in the mobility sector? Um, who wants to start? Mm. Philip? I think um, with all these challenges and so on, I think there, there are huge chances out there because um, as, I, as I quickly presented in my presentation, uh, especially with blockchain, but also with other technologies, um, IoT stuff and AI, um, we will see like a huge growth of this technology and a huge diffusion into all kinds of fields in, in countries and societies that will be really huge. and. I think everybody can be part of this. Um, you know, people wanting to make a good career, people wa wanting to found a company in this area, people wanting uh, to grow our company, people, you know, that's therefore, there are huge chances there for companies and also for um, individual, private individuals, once you are now deciding to basically jump on this train. And I think with all these um, the challenges and the risks and, you know, what might be a threat and so on, this needs to be kept in mind, of course, but I, I, I still think um, the, the chances for startups, companies, and also private individuals are huge. 
for example, if a young student plans to do a career, then he, he rather should focus on, I don't know, blockchain, mobility, and IoT in comparison to 10 years ago when he would focus on a career in a bank, right? You know, you, you, you better not apply for a bank these days uh, with this intermediation coming, but you, you, you might um, get informed with regards to mobility, blockchain, AI, and so on, and then plan a career in these fields, you know, and then you, you will have a good career good personal progress, decent amount of income, income or money earned, uh, I would guess so, uh, in comparison to um, starting a career or a startup in industries which are maybe consolidating or even shrinking. Yeah? And these chances should not be forgotten. I think that's very important. That's a very positive message. Thanks, uh, Philip, for uh, the end of the event. Maria Lear, um, please, um, what are your thoughts about hearing, after hearing all these uh, struggles from, from the funders? Uh, so I, I would say that first thing that you, we need to remember is that blockchain is, after all, a software product, a very complicated one. Most, bi most business people uh, think that Uh, blockchain is like a con development is like a conveyor belt. You put some engineers on one side and yell on them to work quickly, and on the other side you get a, a functional blockchain. And it can't be further than the truth, especially when you're developing a, a public blockchain with a public token of value. You have to be very, very careful and defensive in the way you develop the the software. Otherwise. We all know uh, hackers, scammers. Uh, we, th there is a huge problem for this industry with uh, with fraud around it that we have to solve. Um, many, many interesting challenges. And I would say if I'm now a software engineer at the beginning of my career, I would definitely go uh, and explore one of these uh, blockchain products. Thank you, Leo. Uh, Maria. Yeah, I yeah, fully agree with both gentlemen uh, and everybody else. Uh, I think, you know, these emerging new technologies and especially really their combination will bring us um, new possibilities, uh, new business models, uh, uh, this decentralization. I mean, it's, it's, it's for us really to benefit from that, right? To, to keep our privacy, keep our private data private, um, to decentralize the ownership uh, and also the ownership of AI, uh, you know, to, to give it back people rather than having the intermediaries collect our data, collect information about us and, and having them benefit uh, charging 20, 30% margin of what can be uh, kept uh, if you know, you're the user or the owner uh, of that. Um, so I think there are really you know, new opportunities that will surface. Uh, people will, will learn to, to, to use these new technologies. Um, But coming back, you know, this is really about education and, and um, having more of these workshops and, and having more of these discussions, because I feel that uh, we have only scratched the surface very little even today. Um, you know, we have so many people and there are so many things to be discussed. So I, I would hope that this is just uh, the beginning of our, you know, longer discussion about how, um, how mobility and, and that whole space can benefit from, from these emerging technologies. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Maria, as well, for your input. Uh, so we are going to share the poll, the results of the last poll. We asked the audience, how long will it take to implement blockchain technology in mobility solutions? And the majority of people answers in between one and three years. Then um, Uh, 42%, 38% in between three and five years. So we, we have the major majority in those, in those answers. Um, plus five years, the 19%, and no one believes that is never going <laughs> to be implemented. So uh, thank you very much for participating in the poll. Um, we have come to the end of this third edition of Mobility Talks. It was a great, great pleasure to have such a variety of speakers and a high quality of panelists. Um, I would like to thank all the people who have made this event possible. There was a great team behind in the organization from both organizations, the EIT Urban Mobility and Gelurida. 
a uh, special thanks to all our startups for pitching. I know you are very busy and uh, the day um, is, is not by day by day, it's not easy for you. Um, say thanks to Frederick, uh, Philip, Maria, um, Lior uh, for your valuable insights and expertise. Um, and last but not least, a great thanks uh, to all of you joining us today. Um, we will be back uh, with the next Mobility Talks edition in the end of August. Please follow the EIT Europe Mobility on social media and visit the website. Um, the, um, the next edition will be shared there and also the recording of this uh, webinar will be uploaded in the YouTube channel. Um, so we would appreciate it very much if you would complete the survey uh, that Bernadette has posted in the chat and to provide us with feedback uh, so we can improve for the, for the next uh, mobility talks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great, great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.